Take your chairs, please, and quieten down. Um, my name's Gillian Tett. I'm with the Financial Times. I've come here from New York, where I'm based. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I should say that I've been coming to Kiev with the Yes Forum for many years. Kiev's one of my favorite cities. And I'm particularly delighted to be moderating this panel right now, because we spent the last panel talking about the past, truly fascinating talking about history. This is going to be talking about the future, and in particular, an absolutely crucial question of what kind of security guarantees Ukraine could or should be asking for in the future. It might seem premature to be talking about that now, given the war is still raging. I should start off by saying congratulations on the remarkable events in Kharkiv in the last 48 hours and the news coming out of Kupiansk right now. So the war is still on, but there is a discussion about the future, about security guarantees. Is it reasonable for Ukraine to be asking for NATO-style guarantees, NATO membership? They've asked for that before. They've been let down very badly on several occasions. We've had a report from Andrei Yomak um, early this year with the Rasmussen Group, looking at what's, what you would like to have. But we're going to be talking about what is reasonable. And if NATO-style guarantees are not feasible, what else could Ukraine be asking for? An Israeli-style situation? Something like the Asian-style partnerships with America? Or something else altogether? And is it reasonable to be even asking for that before the war is over, is it reasonable to be asking for that with Crimea or without? Big questions. And we have a fantastic group to talk to us about that. Andrei Yomak, head of the office of the president of Ukraine, crafting much of the strategy. Karl Bildt, former prime minister and foreign minister of Sweden. And Richard Haas, president of the Council of Foreign Relations. So... I'd like to start with you, Andre. I think you will be speaking probably in Ukrainian, so do please get your headsets on, all of you, um, to ask you to explain very succinctly and very clearly exactly what security guarantees you want and when. Um, Thank you, Julian. Thank um, you, Julian. I would like to, uh, to start by saying that Ukraine needs reliable, legally founded guarantees, workable ones, because we do know all too good the Budapest Memorandum and other documents that unfortunately offered us no possibility to defend ourselves from their aggression. But I think uh, no one in the world is able today to call any actual tools uh, that could have per provided opportunity to prevent this horrible war in the 24th century, the war that is lasting for eight years, with the most active phase going for six months. So if speaking succinctly, I would say this should be very clear-cut, very efficient, very reliable legal guarantees. So in practice, do you think it's realistic to expect NATO-style guarantees? I will be frank with you, as of today, uh, it's hard to find any more reliable guarantees than the ones provided by Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty, and this is recognized by everyone. Ukraine has never refused its intention to join NATO at some point in the future, and I think the war that is happening now the courage and the value of our servicemen and simply our opportunity to defend ourselves uh, and possibility to show that we can not just defend ourselves but also deoccupy our territories, it potentially should change NATO's treatment to our aspirations 
I think that strong players, strong members are always for the good of international organizations. They strengthen them. As you mentioned now, the group that we established together with Mr. Rasmussen, the one that is working on uh, the first document with recommendations about the future security guarantee related treaty for Ukraine. So we are talking about the wider sense of the status that Ukraine finds itself today because we need these guarantees already now. The ones that would provide us with not just opportunity to have our defense capability, but also with the possibility of defending us whatever happens in, in terms of aggression. The neighbor we have, it will remain at our borders. Right, well, I'd like to bring in Carl Bildt and ask you, um, the Yermak Rasmussen group that's working on a framework for guarantees has indicated it wants to be ambitious and ask for some pretty sweeping guarantees. Um, people like Chancellor Schultz have indicated that there's no chance of Ukraine getting NATO-style Article 5 guarantees. Do you think that Ukraine is overreaching by asking for Article 5-style guarantees in the future? Well, as uh, Mr. Yamak said, Ukraine is asking for NATO at some point in time. But I mean, we live in the world in which we live. So uh, that is unlikely to happen in the near future. So what we are discussing here, I think, is sort of what can be done if that can't be done at this period in time. And then I do understand the uh, wish for, as Mr. Yamak said, legal security guarantees. The problem is, if you look at European history, it's littered with security guarantees. Um, and they've been all over European history. Um, most famous ones uh, take the guarantee for Belgium's territorial integrity since 1830. It was violated time after time. Uh, nothing really happened. It was legally secured, but nothing happened. Take when uh, the UK, and I think France as well, guaranteed the integrity of Poland prior to 1939. Hitler attacked anyhow. Uh, UK did declare war, but then did nothing. And Hitler continued with aggression against other countries. So I, I, I belong to those that say, well, these papers, fine, um, good to have, but capabilities is what really counts, that's what really guarantees your security. Um, so I would focus on, if we, took, if we talk about building the security of Ukraine, a commitment by nations to make certain that we can help in all sorts of different ways Ukraine to build up the capabilities of deterrence of its own. You can add to that, and we should seek to add to that, but I think that is the fundamental thing. You should add to that a commitment by nations to, in case there's an aggression, to do different sorts of things. And those different sorts of things, I understand that Ukraine would like to have an automaticity to that. I think that's unrealistic. But there you have, and of course, an array from mild sanctions to nuclear war. Um, but I think to be realistic, nations are going to be rather reluctant to commit themselves to something that is automatic in situations that they can't foresee. But um, I would go for uh, a coalition of countries committing themselves over a prolonged period of time to help Ukraine building such defense capabilities that it is credible. And then I would add to that the political commitment of different sorts. Some of that might also come with the EU membership. 42.7, as a matter of fact, is strange enough stronger than Article 5 in the NATO treaty. EU doesn't have an army, though. but there is the political commitment to do something, whatever that something is, right. if uh, the territorial integrity of Ukraine is violated. Well, of course, a really interesting example of a country which does not have automaticity, but nevertheless has a very powerful framework working with America is Israel, where essentially America has committed to supply Israel 
with the means to protect itself without having any kind of you know, written legal contract of automaticity. And I'm going to ask Andre Yermak in a moment to comment on that and whether that's a more viable um, you know, option to be looking for. But first, I'd like to bring in Richard Haas, who has served in Washington in the administration, is very close to the discussions there. Can you tell us um, succinctly, before we hear from Jake Sol Sullivan, exactly what you think President Biden is willing to accept in terms of any type of guarantee? I mean, would he countenance some kind of Israeli-style framework? Would he ex be pushing for some kind of NATO-style framework? Or does he just want to leave it all constructi constructively vague? Or unconstructively vague? I look, I look forward to the day when we can see... Mike, Mike. Your presence projects anyway, Richard, but the Thank microphone you, would help. Uh, look. The debate about whether there ought to be a formal Article 5 like uh, commitment, security guarantee, that's simply, that's not a useful conversation to have at this point. I look forward to the day we can have it again, but we're not there. The real question is what the Biden administration or any U.S. administration would do in an ongoing situation. Uh, and, and there's the question of what would trigger it and what you would commit to do. I think there's two scenarios the Biden administration has to consider. One is more of the same, that it's a long war, and what sort of commitment are they prepared to take in what form about resupply, militarily, economically, intelligence? Uh, and the question then is, what difference would it make if they said it, for example, if in 2025 somebody else occupies the Oval Office, would it necessarily matter? But I think one question is, what are we prepared to do if some version of the present is the future? I think another interesting question related is, what are we prepared to do if Mr. Putin escalates? And that is the question of interwar deterrence and potentially interwar response. If he introduces chemical weapons, if he introduces uh, nuclear weapons, if he introduces a much wider target set with some success. What are we prepared to do then? So I think those are, those are questions for now. I don't think the interesting question is, is to relive the NATO debate. I think the question now is, what are we prepared to do if the status quo persists? What are we prepared to do if potentially, even against this, the backdrop of an improved status quo of military gain, Mr. Putin, a desperate, unconstrained Mr. Putin, threatens to escalate? I would say those are the conversations. I don't think, 30 more seconds, Julian, that necessarily putting them in cement is a realistic goal for the Biden or any administration. Too many uncertainties. I also worry that if we have this conversation in public, it may reveal certain differences about what our definition is. For example, should we keep providing arms towards what end? This is really the conversation for the last session uh, of this conference. So I think we need to have these conversations. We need to plan for them. I'm not sure how formal we want to make them, because when you try to make things formal, you, of, you often sometimes come up against a wall of disagreement. Right. I mean, before I come back to Andre, though, I would like to ask you if you can tell us what do you think the Biden administration would do if chemical weapons are used or if um, there is a cyber attack that goes into NATO countries? Well, cyber has already, to some extent, happened, and it's easier to deal with. Uh, though you can, you can respond in kind, you can respond with sanctions. Indeed, any sort of escalation, you can respond in kind in principle, or you, you can use uh, other tools. I think the cyber conversation would get different if it were very effective and if cyber were used as a weapon of mass destruction, if it were targeting power plant, nuclear power plants, if it were targeting dams and it caused a massive loss of life, that would be, again, a, a kind of, uh, of escalation. I, th I can imagine then it would reopen some basic questions about the level and nature of our participation 
in the uh, conflict. There's not a whole lot more to be done with, uh, with, with, with sanctions. I think also if certain things were done, it might depend again on their effect, if chemicals were used, if there was a demonstration, nuclear thing. But I think the more that Mr. Putin were to do, the less the administration could simply let it stand. It's not simply the impact on Ukraine in this conflict, it's the precedent and the norm. So I think essentially the more that Mr. Putin does that's escalatory, the more it would put pressure on any American administration to respond, not necessarily in kind. For example, if it went to chemical or even certain types of nuclear use, I think the most likely thing would to be to revisit some of the constraints we've put on ourselves about the, the use of conventional force in Ukraine could also put eliminate some of the constraints on targeting certain things within Russia. Right, right. Um, well, I'd like to talk about the present day in a moment. Before I do, I'd like to come back to um, Andre and ask you, do you see Israel as a kind of model for where you want Ukraine to go in the future in terms of having a very strong sense of self-reliance, a determination to build up military capabilities and having a strong army, but also some agreement that it will get supplied by the West, by the US with arms. Is that a kind of model in your mind? No, it's not. Uh, first of all, it's really hard to compare because the Israel model, it was coined in a bit different realities, whilst we are living in completely different circumstances. I think the model we're talking about, I think it will be a Ukrainian model of security. Secondly, Responding to your question, I would also like to react to what my colleagues mentioned. This is very important uh, that one of the mistakes committed by the world was its failure to, to, to do some preliminary preventive deterrent steps that Ukraine did one about. Now, checking these mistakes and collecting this tragic experience on a daily basis, we try to use them to build those security principles, the ones that allow us fighting, defending us today, deoccupying our territories, some of the terms at least. Now, we don't understand what sanctions work, which of them do not, how fast they kick in. We clearly see today what do we need to defend ourselves, what do we need in the event of aggression, uh, well, how we should improve our defense capacity. We have a crystal clear understanding of the financial hardships we are facing today. I'd like to draw your attention that in spite of this horrible war, despite all those hardships, we still have working operational economy. We do pay our retirement benefits, salaries, and so on. And the whole world is witnessing now how in the real time an understanding of what type of guarantees is, are necessary is being formed. And these should be guarantees not just for Ukraine. As President Zelensky had it, today even the, the formula world reaction within 24 hours is necessary not just for Ukraine because the current war with Russia shows no one can feel secure no more because tomorrow Russia may want to grab some other territory and now it is Ukraine that it is that it makes the front line the forefront of this democracy of this fight for the principles for the ideals of freedom and Ukraine does deserve after this war to have very clear very, very clear, not vague uh, guarantees, security guarantees. We don't want them to flop 
when something happens. I would like to remind the words of the new UK Prime Minister. She said on her first day in the office, she said that this war uh, well, found itself in the list of the most powerful countries worldwide. This is just natural that we have to provide our people with certain security guarantees. Do you have um, much hope, Andrei Yermak, um, that given there's rumors that someone like Christia Freeland might be in the running for heading NATO, that that would help your cause? Uh, we our careers together for the Financial uh, Times. She was in Ukraine, I was in Moscow and um, Central Asia, so I've known her for many years. She's a very talented person, and of course, of Ukrainian heritage. Then you should probably know that Mrs. Freeland is a big friend of Ukraine. And surely if a friend of Ukraine comes to the helm of this organization, we will be only glad, and definitely this will Fasten the moment for us of becoming members of that organization. Well, watch this space, as they say. Um, I would never have guessed it, you know, 25, 30 years ago when I was with Christia um, in the former Soviet Union. But, um, Carl, I'd like to ask you. And, wh and what are you a candidate for? <laughs> I have a great job, as Christia said, at the Financial Times. Um, Carl, I'd like to ask you to give a sort of hard-headed assessment of what you think is realistic right now in terms of the position that Ukraine will be in in terms of asking for guarantees. In your view, should Ukraine hold out until it's recaptured the territory that it had in February 2022? Should it be refusing to even start talking about this um, unless or until it gets Crimea back? Or do you think that's simply unrealistic to be trying to push for Crimea at this point? And I ask that because, you know, in Washington, you know, I often hear people saying that actually it is unrealistic to be that ambitious and actually some serious conversation should happen much sooner. What do you think? Well, I think one step at a time. If we look at the um, resolution that was adopted by the UN Security Council, I can't remember the date, but the first days of March, with a majority that we haven't seen for anything that's here is for a very long time. It was, it said very clearly that sort of Russia should go back to where it was in February 24th, but it also talked about the territorial integrity of Ukraine as a whole. If you talk about the European Union endorsed that when they had the summit of the heads of state and government in Versailles a couple of days later, but we could also go back to Crimea, where the EU was clearly committed itself and impose sanctions. You might say there should have been more, but there are still sanctions in place for Crimea, for the territorial integrity. But of course, the interim step would be to go back, for Ukraine to go back to February 24, or prior to that. Uh, that's fairly ambitious, um, and will take more than 90 days, I would guess. Um, and for that to be possible, I guess that we, the outside world, Europe, US, we'll have to commit ourselves first, I would say, to stronger long-term financial commitments. I mean, the Ukraine economy is down 37% or something like that, so it's a question of sustaining medical care, wages, schools, and whatever, to prevent, uh, I've seen countries in war, I know what happens when societies collapse, uh, that must be prevented and then to commit ourselves to military supplies over time. It's been a fair amount of ad hoc so far. But if I take one concrete example from my Swedish point of view, we have delivered 15,084 anti-tank or anti-armor thing. In all honesty, I didn't know that we had 15,000. <laughs> and I can add we don't any longer. So what we are now forced to do, needless to say, is to uh, increase production of 84s. And that turned out to be not that entirely easy to do that fast. 
and AT4 is not necessarily the most sophisticated weapon, fairly sophisticated, but then we are running up against the need to replan European defense industrial capabilities in order to be able to have sustained deliveries paid by our taxpayers to a to large extent to Ukraine. So these things, and to send that signal so that it received in Moscow, that that commitment, financial, defense, industrial, military, is there over time, I think is going to be very important. Both to make the two things, both to make the possibility to Ukraine to achieve what Ukraine must do, but also to influence decision makers, hopefully in Moscow, that this ain't going to succeed ever. So essentially what you're saying is that what's more important rather than a legal document, say with or without Article 5, is clear commitment to a pipeline of money and yeah. weapons over many years in the future. Is that correct? Yeah, I say concentrate because that's the most important. What I'm saying, I mean, Belgium is a good example. Belgium had all of the legal guarantees that you can find. And it was overrun time after time after time because it didn't have sufficient capabilities. It had all of the legalities, but not the capabilities, and it's lost its independence and everything time after time. Sure, can I just push back against that a little bit? Certainly, please do. We can actually have a debate. There are arms pipelines and there are arms pipelines. So to have an agreement that there will be a commitment to provide Ukraine with significant quantity and quality of arms, I, I think that's obvious. The question is towards what end, by what date? And that's where I think there's disagreement. I think it's one thing to say that we should stand with Ukraine 100%, that it should regain every square inch of its sovereign territory. I think that is, that's the right thing to say, not just for Ukraine, but for the world. It's the same reason we went for, to war against Iraq after Iraq invaded Kuwait. This, to the extent there's a rule or a norm out there in international relations, this is it. This is the, the most basic rule. So I think that's important. But to say that Ukraine has to achieve it only through the use of armed force or by a date certain, not necessarily. And I think that would be the conversation that would split NATO and split the arms providers because there would be real disagreements about feasibility but also desirability and the risk you would run given the fact that Vladimir Putin operates under far fewer constraints than somebody like uh, Nikita Khrushchev did. And we don't know what he would want to do and what he could get away with. So I just think, you know, that's why, again, words like guarantees aren't, I think, appropriate here because there isn't the, ex guarantees by definition require explicitness. They need to be automatic. I don't think we are there. What I think we need are understandings, and it may not even be NATO-wide. It might be, if you will, a coalition of the like-minded within NATO, and I think that's okay, or within you know, the West. But I think we have to be more flexible than thinking about something as explicit and as automatic uh, as guarantees here. Well, you raise a good question there, because I want to ask in a moment about non-NATO members, but Andrei, I can see you want yeah. to... Yeah. Yes, if possible, I am quite sure that Putin will go as far as the world is going to allow him to do. It's very important to comprehend this. Another thing, I think that our position at any rate is as follows. Security guarantees should cover the whole territory of Ukraine, internationally recognized one, to avoid any you know, other ideas. This is our position of principle. Non-NATO members, do you expect them to play a role, Andrei? Non-NATO countries? Uh, well, surely this depends on their political will. We definitely support an open format of that. And this war, I think, on the one hand, it forced us. On the other hand, that should have been done much earlier. But again, Ukraine is now open for communication with all countries. For the past month, President Zelensky had more than 20 
phone conversations with African leaders, and surely it was because of the food crisis that Russia has instigated. And I, I think you know everything that happened. You know about the grain initiative. Luckily, we have it operational. I think that it is exactly Ukraine, thanks to support from its partners, thanks to the support from the UN, has been able to to make sure that people in the African continent are no longer dying from or face the threat of famine. I think something similar happens to the Latin America, the Asian countries. We are open. And I think the key conclusion, when entering the hall, I heard some of the last uh, words from the previous panelists. And I heard how this war changed the world, how it showed that the world and just simple people on all the continents have been able to decide and they opted to support Ukraine, to stand with Ukraine. We see many people taking to the streets to support Ukraine. I think it is them who will formulate the agenda for the world tomorrow. And I'm very much sure that already today they have made their decision, made their up their mind about the future of Ukraine and the future of the safer world, the idea of, Ukraine, of a Ukraine in its own uh, land, within its own borders, as set in the international laws. Yeah, Richard. And by the way, can, can the organizers tell me, I can see several people want to ask questions. Is that... Yeah, okay. Just Richard, and then we're going to go to the audience for questions there and then over there. One thing Carl mentioned, which I want to echo and expand, we also have to look at capacity to help Ukraine. This is not the only struggle in the world right now. We've got to think about uh, Taiwan and that entire scenario. We've got to think about our friends in the Middle East potentially facing Iran. We've got to deal with the fact that American forces are also uh, under-resourced right now. So, and given the American industrial, ba defense industrial based European one, it's, it's not as though this is simply, uh, it's not the only, to put it bluntly, as important as this is, it's not the only thing out there that's important. And America, and the Biden administration, you asked me before, is going to have to weigh the extent of support here, not simply against local considerations, but also there are global trade offs as well. Absolutely. I cannot but comment on this as well. Yeah. I'd like to say that undoubtedly there are some wars in different parts of the world presently, but this is a unique one. There's nothing like it uh, any, anywhere. Um, and presently the United States and other partners of ours uh, are helping, continue their help uh, rendered to different countries. But let's be frank here. They would give us three days, and now all this assistance that is provided by you, your nations that we appreciate so much, is effective because you can see the result. Some countries wouldn't uh, hold the line for a couple of days. So we've done this for six months now against uh, the second uh, best army in the world, so to speak. Uh, the biggest threat to NATO now recognized we're not, uh, not just uh, um, uh, holding the line, but we are deoccupying the territories with the HIMARS provided by your donor nations. Thank you very much for that. And the world is our witness. We have two questions here. Is it helpful or not that the aid that's being provided is coming in dribbles? You know, every other day there's a new package coming out, you know, a bit here, a bit there, a bit there, a bit there. Is that better or worse? Of course, uh, it's better to get everything in one package, but we get what we get. And uh, the sooner we get all the things that we really need, the sooner we'll be able to stop this war. I think that all our friends now, all our partners, uh, are also very much interested in our victory, because our victory is going to be our uh, joint victory of the civilized world. 
we'll share it with it. And then a question over there. Um, and if you can, do I, am I going on that? Yeah. Andrei has a very difficult task. He has to do the impossible, projecting into the future without understanding what kind of enemy Russia will present or whether it will present any hostility against Ukraine. So this document is important for Ukraine. This is how important it is for the Ukrainian society. Such uh, security safeguards as part of the victory in this war. Because if um, Russia uh, falls back, uh, is driven out of the territory, um, is um, back to partnership, uh, what will that uh, change? Andrei said they can go as far as they want. Um, Richard said they reckless and can do pretty much anything from chemical to nuclear. What are your assumptions about Russia? What are we securing from? Uh, and by the way, I've been told that apparently the clock I've been watching is out of sync with the organizers' agenda. So we can stop now if you want after this question or carry on. Um, okay. Well, please do answer. Because I can see lots of hands waving. Thank you very much um, for your question. I'm happy to see you. Of course, this is extremely important for Ukrainians. It is important because now during this war, we are discovering for ourselves uh, there's new friends, uh, new opportunities. And uh, without any doubt, we have to be confident, confident in our future. And um, we have to be certain that uh, if, uh, God forbid, anybody tries it again anywhere, we are ready for it. So, so now we clearly understand what readiness is as a notion. That's what we learned from this war. And uh, we clearly understand how we can provide for ourselves, provide uh, for our own um, place uh, on the security map of not just Europe, but all the world. And uh, undoubtedly, uh, for Ukrainians, this is very important. Uh, this is a uh, uh, life and death matter. Right. Um, well, we live at a time when it's important to obey orders and be disciplined. And so I will obey the orders I've been given, which is to bring this to an end and have some dinner. So. Um, I know we could carry on talking about this a lot, and I can see many, many hands waving at me, but it just remains for me to say thank you very much indeed for addressing what's obviously a moving target and a very sensitive issue, and best of luck in particular to Andri in trying to square this very difficult circle, and congratulations on what's happened in the last 48 hours. So thank you.